Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar for municipalities titled Models of Engagement with Safe Routes to School. I also want to wish you all a very happy Massachusetts Winter Walk, Bike, and Roll to School Day. Today and over the month of February, we have over 120 schools registered to participate in this flagship day. Thank you for being here and spending time with us today. My name is Diane Hanson. I'm the program director for the Massachusetts Safe Routes to School program. I'm joined today by outreach coordinators, Rachel O'Donnell and Vivian Ortiz, who will be our speakers. We also have our other outreach coordinators on uh, and you'll see them in a little bit. We have two special guests, Lieutenant George Larini from the Holliston Police Department and Jonah Chiarenza from, or Chiarenza from the Melrose Pedestrian and Bicyclist Committee. I'll share their bios right before they speak. So today, here is our agenda. Rachel's gonna be taking us through how we went from enforcement to engagement and provide some history and context for the decision. Vivian's going to talk about the different opportunities that community-led organizations and law enforcement have when supporting a local Safe Routes to School program. Our guest speakers will follow with examples of how they support their local Safe Routes to School efforts, and then we'll go into our breakout groups. Time permitting, we will have a little Q&A at the end. Leon is going to put a PDF of our slides that we're going through today in the chat window right now. So I know in the past, some of you have asked for that. So that is going into the chat. We'll also probably put it in uh, again in a little bit for those who join uh, late, later. So on to the next section, I'm gonna pass the presentation along to Rachel, who's going to talk about enforcement to engagement. Rachel? Perfect, thanks, Diane. Let's get started by reviewing the national and local Safe Routes to School organizations. The Safe Routes Partnership, the National Center for Safe Routes to School, and the Massachusetts SRTS program are all independently run organizations that provide tools, training, and technical assistance. They also have similar missions. The Safe Routes Partnership is a nonprofit organization working to advance safe walking and rolling to and from schools and in everyday life improving the health and well-being of people of all races, income levels, and abilities. Longtime partners include AARP, the National PTA, the American Heart Association, Smart Growth America, and People for Bikes, just to name a few. The partnership is a nonprofit that relies on private donations to operate. They don't just focus on safe routes to school, but also advocate for safe routes to parks and trails. The key word I just mentioned was advocate. They do work closely with folks in DC to advance federal funding for all types of Safe Routes activities. The National Center for Safe Routes to School has a history of being managed through multiple federal contracts, but is currently housed under the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. The National Center was established in 2006 when the Highway Safety Research Center was selected to serve as the Federal Highway Administration's Safe Routes to School Clearinghouse. In addition to the Federal Highway Administration, other funders include the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Schwinn, Clorox Screenworks, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The National Center collects data on SRTS programs around the country, helps with parent travel surveys and travel tallies, and hosts a registration site for national flagship days. Lastly, the Massachusetts Safe Routes to School program is funded by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation with federal funds. Arlington Mass was actually one of the first SRTS pilot projects in the entire United States before SRTS programs started receiving federal funding in 2005. We are one of the oldest statewide programs in the nation and have operated for over 15 years now. Even though the National Center has event registration and survey support, our program developed our own parent guardian travel survey and flagship event registration. We operate independently of the partnership and the center, but we do belong to their community of support and networks. Our Safe Routes to School program strives to implement a collaborative community focused approach that bridges the gap between health and transportation. The six E's of the SRTS program serve as a comprehensive approach to guide these statewide efforts. Originally, there were just five E's, and only within the last few years was equity brought in as the sixth E. Effective in June 2020, the Safe Routes Partnership dropped enforcement as one of the E's of Safe Routes to School. 
There's an extensive statement from them on their website providing the reasons for doing so, but the result was that in order to emphasize the importance of tailoring a Safe Routes to School program to the needs and assets of the community it serves, engagement is now the new E. We know and understand that in some communities, there are negative perceptions or strained relationships with local law enforcement. We also understand that some enforcement mechanisms disproportionately impact low-income low people and people of color. Our relationship with community stakeholders, including law enforcement officials, is based on engagement and less about enforcement, and therefore our program supports a change to the word engagement. The word engagement better reflects our interactions with community-based organizations such as bike ped committees, libraries, community task forces, and local law enforcement throughout the Commonwealth. We recognize that relationships between communities and their local law enforcement vary, and it is the decision of each community on how they choose to engage. The safety of our students, crossing guards, volunteers, and school staff often relies on the support and guidance of local law enforcement. We also wanted to give you some context for the types of engagement we have in Massachusetts. The last two school years in March of 2019 and 2020, we conducted a Safe Routes to School partner survey. One of the questions we ask is which community partners are involved with your school's MA Safe Routes to School program? As you can see here, law enforcement, community bike ped groups, public works, and PTOs, PTAs are the most prominent answers. As Safe Routes practitioners, we also know this to be true anecdotally from what we encounter in the field. I think this is a really good time to transition and pass the presentation to Vivian, who will discuss building intentional opportunities for ongoing engagement. Vivian? Thanks, Rachel. Whether or not your community engages local law enforcement to implement your Safe Routes to School program, all Safe Routes to School initiatives should invite participant, participation from students, families, teachers, school leaders, and existing community organizations. First, let's talk about how engagement includes both community-led organizations and local law enforcement. The overlap may not be equal depending on the community, but there are opportunities to vary the level of involvement based on the needs of the community. A task force is one of the best ways to combine SRTS, community-led organizations, and law enforcement. I will talk more about task forces in some later slides, but let's first talk about how community-led organizations engagement in general, and law enforcement play a role in supporting SRTS. Before sharing some of the SRTS engagement strategies, I'd like to speak about engagement in general. Throughout the Commonwealth, municipalities are building housing, redesigning public spaces and streets, constructing new school buildings, and more. Information about these projects is usually shared electronically or at public meetings. This process works for the most part, but not for some communities or for some individuals within communities. Engaging with communities that are unfamiliar with the municipality's process can be challenging. Some barriers exist, including language, family responsibilities, work conflicts, access to and familiarity with the digital world. And in some cases, there is a lack of trust because of disinvestment in the community. Getting to know the community by spending time in the area, reaching out to churches, visiting youth centers, and preparing materials in the languages spoken by residents all help to build familiarity and trust with communities. Online surveys and public meetings may not work in all communities. For example, in Barnstable, the Cape Cod Commission worked closely with churches to identify the community's priorities and needs related to transportation infrastructure. And in Weymouth, the public access channel is a great way to get information out to their senior population. As bike and ped infrastructure improvements are being made at or near schools, connecting with students, families, teachers, staff and residents is crucial. Keep in mind that not everyone is familiar with transportation's technical language. Work with the parent-teacher organizations and conduct special outreach during the process to invite the population they may benefit most from the improvements, the students. And remember to invite your SRTS coordinator to any public meetings where infrastructure projects near schools are being proposed or discussed. Now, let's talk about the types of organization that SRTS engages with. 
Take a look at the types of organizations listed on this slide. You may be familiar with some of them or even participate and volunteer with others of them. We're all aware that school administrators, faculty and staff are often overwhelmed with all the tasks, procedures and performance measures expected of them. Schools and districts lean on community led organizations to provide an extra set of hands for coordination and communications. Our team at SRTS leans on these community based organizations as well. Interaction with schools has been challenging since the start of the pandemic, especially in communities where students have not returned to school. When we started offering virtual bike safety sessions, we reached out to the Boys and Girls Club of Metro South Clubhouse in Brockton. They had created a learning pod in the early days of the pandemic. And just last month, we were able to provide bike helmets to the students attending school at the clubhouse. And our outreach coordinators work with a variety of community groups throughout the Commonwealth. PTOs and neighborhood associations are great partners in supporting Safe Routes to School efforts. In a few minutes, you'll be hearing more examples of engagement from Jonah, our guest speaker from the Melrose Pedestrian and Bicyclist Committee. Now I'd like to bring attention to the many ways that the law enforcement community supports Safe Routes to Schools efforts. First, during arrival and dismissal, the crossing guard's role is to create an adequate gap in traffic for children to cross the street safely. By law, crossing guards are not allowed to direct traffic. Only a police officer can do that. Sometimes patrols support the crossing guards by directing traffic in the school zone. A school in Lee in Western Mass works closely with the local police to help direct traffic in that school zone. And oftentimes the police department manages the crossing guard programs. Secondly, there is still a role for enforcement within SRTS. In every community we visit, we hear from parents, teachers and school staff asking what can be done about excessive idling, speeding and reckless driving. One of the reasons we encourage schools to use signage from the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, also known as the MUTCD, is that officers can enforce the regulations related to vehicle idling, speeding at a school zone, and yielding to pedestrians in a crosswalk, which will help deter some of these unsafe behaviors. Three, the officers, since officers are familiar with traffic trouble spots and dangerous intersections, they often participate in school and or municipal traffic safety groups. Number four, law enforcement officers can lead walking school buses or bike trains, especially if school staff or parent volunteers are not available. Lastly, many of our communities rely on the police department to host or support us with bike rodeos. This year, we worked closely with officers at rodeos in Braintree, Dedham, and Holliston, where they gave out bike helmets and assisted with fittings. At SRTS, we encourage the development of task forces. They can bring community-led organizations, school staff, parents, law enforcement, and other municipal staff together for the benefit of supporting an SRTS program. A task force is intentional and provides structure, a mission, and goals. The group can be formed to address a particular issue or concern within the school or community. In the North Shore, our outreach coordinator, Judy, has been meeting with the Cape Ann Regional Youth Prevention Network about working on their transportation challenges to increase school attendance and decrease tardiness. In addition to the list that is here on the, on the screen, task forces also engage with SRTS by supporting and sharing information about events like today's winter walk, providing education and programming for students, teachers, parents, and guardians, obtaining and placing regulatory and informational signage on or near school property, developing district or municipal safe routes to school policies, forming and or leading walking school buses and bike trains, and also supporting engineering and infrastructure evaluation and needs. We have a tip sheet on our website under engagement that provides all the steps for forming a task force. At the start of formation, your SRTS coordinator can help you bring together all the appropriate people, but they cannot lead the task force. 
It is crucial that the task force be led by someone in the school or in the community, and it must have engagement from the schools. We cannot lose sight of the fact that the students are the ultimate beneficiaries of these efforts, and therefore the local school or district must be involved. Please reach out to one of our coordinators if you are interested in learning more about starting a Safe Routes to School Task Force in your community. I will now pass the presentation back to Diane to introduce our first guest speaker. Thank you so much, Vivian and Rachel, for taking us through the journey from enforcement to engagement and showing us how a task force can align all of our engagement opportunities. Our first speaker is Lieutenant George Larini from the Holliston Police Department. Lieutenant Larini began his law enforcement career as an auxiliary police officer for the town of Randolph, Massachusetts in 1996. First serving as a volunteer officer, he was later hired by the Boston Housing Authority Police Department as a full-time patrol officer within the patrol division. In May of 2003, he was hired to work with the Holliston Police Department as a patrol officer, primarily focusing on traffic-related issues. After three years of hard work and dedication, he was promoted to sergeant and was assigned as patrol shift supervisor. In November of 2019, he was promoted to the rank of lieutenant, where he now oversees the patrol division, information technology, track the traffic enforcement unit, communication center, motorcycle unit, canine unit, grant management, and as a liaison to several community-based organizations. And with all of that, he still has time to speak with us today. So we're really excited to have him. Lieutenant Larini, um, hopefully you are off mute and we can take you through the next slide. And Rachel's also gonna be kind of popping in and out of this presentation and asking some questions of Lieutenant Larini. Thank you, Diane. Uh, in the town of Holliston, we are um, just south, south Middlesex, just before we hit Worcester and North Fork, uh, Middlesex uh, County. Uh, we house about 15,000 residents. Um, we're about 28 miles west of Boston. We have two elementary schools and one middle school on uh, Woodland Street. We're all joined together and we represent about 2,000 students. Uh, what do we do? Uh, so our Holliston Police Department oversees two school resource officers. And those resource officers help with traffic, uh, with uh, parents coming in and out of school. Uh, they're assigned uh, to also help with speed in that general area and to help any issues with the students before they become uh, police matters. Um, we also oversee uh, two crossing guards and with the help of our, our select board, we actually got a third crossing guide to go in front of the middle school because we have so many students crossing the street. Uh, and because of the school crossing guards and the SRO see all these kids riding their bikes to schools, we noticed that a lot of them weren't having helmets, didn't have the proper safety gear, or weren't using proper hand signals. So I started the bike rodeo with uh, Sergeant uh, Jeff Watson from the Medway Police Department. So once a year we host a rodeo and if any student needs a bike helmet, uh, we distribute the helmets to these students. We show them the proper way uh, to ride a bike, how to uh, avoid obstacles, use proper hand signals, wear bright clothing, we'll make sure that they uh, always have their head on a swivel looking around. Um, and then uh, since that point, and that's as of last year, I joined the uh, Safe Routes to Schools Task Force with Rachel, uh, Select Woman Tina Hines, and uh, uh, Vice Principal Jess Beaton. As since then, we come up with uh, ways to help kids uh, get to school safely without their parents driving them. So we do have the uh, park and walk to school. We have designated locations where the parents could drop the kids off and then they can walk to school. And that's where we come involved because we have to assure the parents that these kids can go to school, school safely. So during the day shift, I have the day patrol officers out on uh, routine patrol in these general areas, watching the speed, uh, watching the uh, stop sign violations and, and that sort to keep the kids to go to school safely. And as of January this year, the town uh, reduced all speed limits uh, to 25 miles an hour in non posted roads. So this way it gives some type of uh, assurance to the parents that the speed limits have been reduced. We're out there enforcing traffic rules and regulations. We're getting the kids to, to the school safely. And we also oversee the uh, rail trail. So the kids use the rail trail and then while we're on the rail trail as well uh, on our mountain bikes, we, we also help them 
with education and bike safety and getting to the school safe. And from that point forward, because our SROs have such a great rapport with the schools, uh, Chief Stone uh, instituted the first pumpkin patrol. Uh, what that is, is that uh, just after Halloween or right around that time, the kids come to the Holliston Police Department, they get to paint a uh, pumpkin that is donated from our local farms. They wear their costumes, they get to meet the officers on shift, they take a tour of the station. And, and so this way it kind of breaks that fear of the kids approaching us. So they get accustomed to seeing us, they get accustomed to talking to us, and then we can help them with any fears or questions they have or walking to school or while in school. And we can address some of these issues as they come up. Uh, I can tell you, Chief has a strong uh, community commitment. Uh, the word community policing is more than just words or a phrase that he uses. Uh, we actually practice it. Uh, all of our officers are out there all the time, engaging elementary and middle school uh, kids. Um, during the bike rodeo, officers come on off-duty time to help out with the bike rodeo. Officers on patrol shifts swing by. So we do have a strong commitment to the community when it comes to the kids. These kids are our future. Uh, we want them to have faith and trust in us. And with that, if uh, the kids have faith and trust in us, the parents will have faith and trust in us. And this way, if there's any issues, they can come to us before anything turns into any uh, police matter. That's great, George. I was just wondering, do you mind sharing the story behind um, the student in the photo receiving one of the bike helmets? Yes. So what I put out there is that any student who needs a helmet year round and the, the parents can't afford the helmets because they're very expensive, I let them know to come see me right away. So this one parent uh, reached out to me and uh, she said her teenage son needed a helmet, but the helmet has to look cool. Um, so I told her to come down. Or I, Safe school, uh, safe routes to school. Donated some helmets to us. She said our helmet she liked. It was the blue one. Uh, she picked it out, and he was ecstatic by it. He wears it all the time now, and he actually came by the police department, and we gave over some safety instructions. Uh, the, we gave him a bright uh, yellow wristband, put around his wrist, and he likes to wear it around his ankle so he can be seen at night. And we teach him the safety functions of the bicycle and how to be safe on the roadways. That's great. And then I think um, when we were talking once you mentioned, you know, the positive reinforcement, you know, if you see good behavior out on the streets, you like to reward that. You don't mind sharing a couple examples of that. Yes. Uh, so that's uh, part of our community commitment. So when uh, we're on patrol during the summertime, in the springs, when kids are out there real active, we have a very heavy uh, downtown area where kids like to ride their bikes uh, to and from school to and from the park. If we see them wearing the helmets, we see them using the crosswalk, hitting the crosswalk button, uh, getting off their bicycles and walking uh, in the crosswalk, we stop and we engage them in a positive manner and we give them a coupon to get a free ice cream at the local shop. Uh, you know, and we reward them sometimes with a baseball card or they get to sit inside the cruiser and look into the cruiser to see what's going on. And it's a positive uh, engagement between us and the kids. That's great. It sort of answers one of my questions about, you know, what are the benefits that you've seen from working with Holliston schools on their Safe Routes to School program? Um, I remember driving by once and seeing full bike racks, and I thought that was really great to see at the middle school, but I didn't know if you had any other positive outcomes that you've seen. Uh, yeah, working with the school is incredible because we get information that we normally wouldn't get. Uh, see, uh, you, Rachel, you, uh, you had a survey done, you put it out there, so we actually I was able to take a look at and see what are the hotspots. Some of the parents were actually really responsive to that survey. So some of their concerns were, well, this street right here and that street uh, is not safe for our kids to ride a bike. So what I can do on my end is I can put officers in that general area during that time to make sure they give that safety uh, safety net so they know that their kids will be safe going to and from school. Awesome. And then I guess sort of the closing question I have for you is people listening on this call might want to know do you have any advice for how to engage, you know, more with the local police department in their community or how the local police department can better engage with the community itself? So just whatever bit of advice you can leave everyone with. But, uh, to get anywhere in our lives, not career, it, it takes a conversation. You can't be afraid to ask. Uh, Chief Galvin's online here. Chief Galvin was actually my mentor uh, when I first started out. Uh, he's the one that got me uh, interested in riding bikes. Uh, and Whalen, when he was a sergeant at Whalen, a patrol officer, we would escort the middle school on the bicycles all the way to the uh, park in Lincoln, Mass. 
And he's the one that showed me how to engage the community, how to reach out to the people, to that network. And that's the biggest thing is the network to get out there. And once they get comfortable being around you, you know, you, the conversation starts to take place. And, you know, you get to know what their fears are. You get to know what their concerns are and how to address it. Sometimes we don't have the answer. Sometimes they have the answer. And sometimes we overanalyze a problem. And then when they bring it to our attention, like, yeah, you're right. This is, this is the best way, this is the best approach. Great. Well, thank you so much, George. And again, thank you so much for being a member of the Hollis and Safe Routes Task Force. But I will pass the baton back to Diane and thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks, Lieutenant Larini, for sharing some successful examples of law enforcement engagement that support our Safe Routes to School program. I'm now pleased to welcome Jonah Chiarenza, Chair of the Melrose Pedestrian and Bicyclist Committee, a group which is a group of residents, vol resident volunteers working to improve conditions for pedestrians and bicyclists in the city and to promote walking and bicycling as a means of transportation to, from, and within Melrose. Professionally, Jonah is a transportation planner. Jonah's going to talk to us about community-led approach to bike and ped safety. Jonah, welcome. Great, thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation and, uh, and thanks to Judy, especially for um, the partnership with Safe Routes to School. It, it means a lot to us and it's a, it's a critical element of uh, extending the benefit of our work. So if you can go to the next slide for me. So I wanna talk about sort of three topics. There's advocacy, partnership, and technical support. Those are the things that we bring. By not actually being an official part of the city, um, we can be advocates. We can push the city and show up at hearings and you know, uh, tell them what we really think, so to speak, write letters, that sort of thing. But at the same time, we wanna be um, reasonable and ask for things that we think are feasible, feasible within budget um, and within the means of the city, even if it's a little bit of a reach. And part of making, um, sort of holding up our end of that bargain is to partner with the city, not just ask them to do things, but say, let's do this together. Um, and then one of the ways that we partner, one of the values that we bring is by providing technical support. Now I realize not every community group could do this. We happen to have um, a lot of members, um, not unlike myself, that just happen to have uh, an interest in um, community engagement and uh, community advocacy work that also have a background in transportation planning, um, engineering, environmental design, architecture, um, we also have people with fundraising and organizing skills and these sort of soft political skills, which are um, helpful, particularly when you're dealing with you know, elected officials. Um, and also we have a diversity of people on our, um, on our uh, committee, which is really important. Um, we have men and women, we have new residents, we have older longtime residents, um, we've got young parents, we've got seniors. Um, so that's that's important too because we want to represent the community's voice and we don't want to be sort of in a silo so when we're coming up with ideas or debating something the city's proposed we want to make sure we're representing the full community next slide please so uh, as they say pictures worth a thousand words so one of the things that we've done is to develop some renderings to show what the proposals we have for our streets might look like this is lower main street uh, in Melrose that connects the city down to Oak Grove, which is the terminus of the Orange Line. Um, it connects into um, uh, Assembly Square, and Somerville and Boston beyond. And the uh, important thing here is to, to pose this not just as a bike project. I think there's a lot of times when community groups get together and they have bike in their name, there can be an assumption that they're just about bikes and they're maybe only in favor of you know, providing access for people with the Lycra and the lightweight racing bikes. What's really important for us to, to not just communicate, but really to, to deliver is projects that improve safety for all road users. And bike lanes are an important part of that. Uh, if possible, separate and protected bike lanes as shown here, but adding crosswalks, making sure the crosswalks are daylit, which means nobody can park right against the crosswalk to obscure somebody stepping off the curb into uh, the street to cross that encourages um, yielding, making the road feel and look and actually be narrower, which um, can help slow down uh, vehicles and um, allow people to have more time to react, um, driving more closely to the speed limit. 
Uh, next slide, please. So one of the other um, components of our, our products is not just sort of those nice visualizations, so to speak, but um, actually doing these more sort of technical drawings. Um, again, something that our committee can do because we found people in our community that have, or our committee can do because we found people in our community that, that have these skills. Um, the design here is showing a protected intersection. So if you click uh, twice more, We'll zoom in and then what's really important to us is not just to come up with all of these ideas in a vacuum and say we think you should do this but say not only do we think you should do this this is in the mass dot separated bike lane design guide so this is a very you know official type of treatment it's um it's a little bit ambitious and it will cost some money but it's going to provide a lot of benefits Let's talk about ways that we can work together to explore this as a, an option for redesign of the street, look for ways to get grant funding for it. Um, and again, that's about that sort of pushing the envelope, but also trying to make sure what we're proposing is actually feasible, fits on the road. Next slide, please. So um, one of the other projects that we have worked on is um, Slow Streets, inspired by the uh, work that a lot of communities around the country have been doing to respond to COVID. Um, in the spring, we put together a proposal and then MassDOT provided the slow streets or shared streets and spaces grant funding. And we had already prepared something to encourage the city to pursue um, these types of projects. And now, um, wonderfully, there was this funding source for it. And so we worked with the city to develop a proposal and got um, $55,000 that um, we used. And, one of the things that was important to us was not to drop projects sort of from the sky on the community, um, but to actually work with community members to empower them and make them be the advocates for themselves in their own streets. There's any street in Massachusetts, I'm sure you can find somebody who lives on that street who thinks the cars are driving too fast. In many cases, they may well be correct, um, but they have very little that they can do personally about it. And so what we wanted to do was create the Slow Streets program that used simple materials, cones and signs like you see here to um, allow communities to request a slow street. And then we would work with them. And there were two touch points where the city, the mayor's office would send out a letter saying, hey, we're going to be doing this thing on your street. Your, your neighbors have requested it. Here are the block captains. They will be getting in touch with you. And um, we did sort of a sign up to get the majority of people um, to to demonstrate that they were in favor of it. And then a second letter went out saying, okay, you know, your street has been approved. The cones will be dropped off on such and such a date. And we would go out as committee members and work with the, the residents to put the cones out to basically block off um, the entrance to the street so that it was narrower, not completely blocked, but narrower and have a couple of what are called chicanes or neck downs. If you go to the next slide, please, you can see some more examples that just narrow the street in the middle um, effectively just like a car being parked there and makes people slow down and sort of navigate around the cones. Um, again, this was um, something that we, we did, you know, fairly organically, but it was critical for us to have the buy-in of the city and work with the city to have that official component to it, um, but then do as much of the work ourselves to minimize the impact on city resources and staff. We did three projects last fall and we've set a target to do 10 more this year and I think there's no reason this couldn't be ongoing. Originally inspired by COVID because we wanted people to be able to get out of the house and recreate and the streets is a great place to do that. Um, but we wanted to be able to do it safely. Um, you know, there's no reason we shouldn't want that all the time. So um, we sort of are, are hoping to roll this into a, an ongoing um, slow streets uh, traffic calming program uh, for, for residents. Next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. So, um, one of the other components of that grant was um, building a parklet. Um, we actually got uh, $40,000 as part of that grant that we used for um, to come up with a design ourselves. So we, we came up with a design. I worked with a friend of mine from architecture school. We built a mock-up in my backyard, and then we built a full five module parklet with 20 volunteers over three days. Jonah, we might have lost your audio. We'll give Jonah a few seconds to see if we can get his audio back.
Oh, I'm sorry. Did, can you still hear me? We can hear you now again. Great. Go ahead, Jonah. Okay, thanks. Sorry. I think my phone just cut out. Um, and so we, we built this and we collaborated with a local group, um, Follow Your Art, to create some public art. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Oh yeah, this is the mayor's chief of staff <laughs> who came out to help us uh, do the installation. So there was like, you know, a real great collaborative partnership. So here was the final park hood that we installed on Main Street. And you can see the art panels. Those were created by uh, this local group, the nonprofit that does community art projects. Um, we're going to build three more. If you go to the next slide, you see another nighttime view. We had some lighting out there. And um, we're going to build three more over the winter. So um, last thing I wanted to focus on was the, the sort of regional work. I think, you know, it's great for us to be doing this work in Melrose, but we also want to contextualize our work in a regional framework of sustainable travel. I mean, a lot of what we do benefits not just Melrose residents, but people who come into the community. Um, it's safer for them to come into the community or to come through the community. A lot of people will use Main Street to commute down into Malden and on to, uh, to Boston or Point South. So um, we've worked, if you can do two more clicks, you'll see a little zoom in. We've been working with MAPC and Senator Lewis's office and our representative, Kate Lippert Garabedian, to, um, and the communities of Malden and Wakefield and Stoneham to think about connecting a bunch of these off street paths that we have that necessarily have to use on road routes um, to connect. We have a bunch of old right of ways from railroads that were repurposed into these great community trails, but getting to them can be challenging. Um, connecting them would be great, not just from a recreational standpoint, but from a, um, a transportation standpoint. And I think a lot of these trails are gonna be important for us as we look to a greener future with uh, fewer tailpipe emissions and the ability to more safely get around um, by, by foot or by bike. Uh, next slide. I think if you click on this slide, it may animate. Nope, okay. Um, a friend of mine riding her, her kid to school the other day. Oh, there we go. And, uh, you know, Windsor, I think it was like 15 degrees. So there, there are people who want to ride. We don't think everybody should ride, but we think if you want to, it should be safe for you. Um, here's a picture of my daughter who, um, over the course of a year growing up considerably uh, on our trips to her elementary school. Um, Again, a great partnership, a lot of benefits, um, working with Safe Routes to School and um, something that we are going to continue to, to leverage to benefit our community and the region as a whole. Um, please check out our website there and we have a, a good Twitter feed as well. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jonah. I do want to say to the uh, the PDF document that Leon put in the chat has active links to all, every, everywhere that you see a web page or um, social media, those links are live. So uh, go ahead and click on those. So th uh, thank you so much for an engaging presentation from both of our presenters. And uh, we are now going to go into our breakout groups. So Leon is going to be running those. Let's go on to the Next slide. Um, these breakout groups were randomly assigned. You have three rooms, two moderators each. So in room one, we have Judy and Rachel. Room two is Emily and Vivian. And room three is Pat and me. Um, Leon and William will be floating and also helping with support for the breakout groups. Uh, let's see, it is 1239. We were hoping to get about 15 minutes. So Leon, I'm going to uh, have this open for 15 minutes at 12. Uh, let's call it 54. If you could do um, uh, a notice to everyone that we're going to be closing the breakout rooms, but let's try and give everyone at least 15 minutes. So um, we will have guided discussion questions. Um, when I give Leon the word, he's going to press the button and everything should, uh, something should pop up on your screen asking you to join the breakout room. And then if you can't get in, Leon will be there to support you. So Leon, go ahead and open the breakout rooms and we'll be in here for about 15 minutes. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so I am, um, I, we may not have time to actually do a breakout recap. So, um, but I know in our group, we had a, a really great discussion with all of the, the different um, 
things that were happening in our communities. Um, I will, I'll just put it out there. If Judy or Emily, if there was something spe uh, specific you wanted to share or just let me know if it's okay to go on to the um, uh, next slide. And I can't see you, so I'll have to hear you. No, I, I agree. We had um, good conversations as well in our group, but I know um, everyone's on a time crunch and okay. myself as well. So. Judy. And, and just to echo the same, thank you so much, for all of you, for participating and for sharing. And we touched on everything from curriculum to traffic safety groups to um, helmet fitting um, and incentives along the way. So thank you all. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I have breaking news. This is what I wanted to get to. We just launched our Safe Routes to School program dashboard last week. This is available on the main page of our website. There's a little button, but also the PDF that Leon put in the chat. And Leon, you might want to drop that in the chat again, just for anyone who joined a little bit late. Um, the link, well, if you click on this picture, it'll take you directly to the dashboard. Um, if you select your school, your district, or your municipality from the left, it'll bring up all of the schools in that area that are partners, and then specifically bring up the activities and the recent activities that these schools have engaged with our outreach coordinators or um, if they've participated in winter walk, if they've done a bed safety. So I'm anticipating a lot of people going and just playing around to see what your school's been up to. So this is part of our wanting to um, really be transparent and um, let you know what's going on with safe routes to school and how much we're how much we're doing and i love the, the green map showing what, where all our partners are so go ahead and uh, make sure you visit our website to take a look at that upcoming events on february 22nd we are opening our nominations for crossing guard of the year and then we are also starting our yard sign design contest on march 1st we will launch our annual partner survey so this is the third time that we're doing that. So please look out for that. We really love your feedback. And then the first annual Massachusetts Crossing Guard Appreciation Day is on March 24th, or you can celebrate any time in March. Spring webinar is coming up soon. Our next flagship day, Massachusetts Walk, Bike and Roll, and then our June annual award ceremony is virtual. So those are some things coming up. Um, Leon, were we able to answer all questions or um, do we need to get back to some folks offline? There's one question. There's one question for Jonah that uh, came in from uh, somebody. What is the curbstone to curbstone road width in your main street slide? Oh, the curb to curb? Uh, curb, it's to curb. 44 feet. I think. That question was from Philip Rod. Uh, okay. Yeah, from you Philip Posner. <laughs> Hey, Philip. That's all we have, Diane. Okay. And um, I do believe that I have uh, William putting our evaluation in the chat. There is a link to evaluation. Uh, please go in and let us know how we did today so that we can improve every time we do a webinar. And uh, if you did have any questions, you can certainly email your outreach coordinator, go to our website, find who your outreach coordinator is. And on the new um, program dashboard, there's also a click to email your outreach coordinator. So lots of different ways to get a hold of us. Thank you so much. It's 101. We went a little bit over, but I appreciate uh, you all being here today and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you, Officer George.